in your wallets you've all got money and on either side of your money are some faces and they're the visible faces but it's my strong strong belief that on either side of your money there's also a bunch of invisible faces and they're the faces that aren't actually stamped on there like the others but they're the ones that you get to put on there they're invisible faces that are essentially attached to the way you use your money the stories and quite often they're pretty hard to hear but what I'd love to share with you today is my view that those other invisible faces are our responsibility, even if they're pretty hard to hear those stories. If we think about the way we use our money, most of us are trying to get a bargain. You know, we've got this little equation that's happening in our head about what makes good value and what doesn't make good value. So we might be thinking about, for example, well, you know, price might be important, the look of something, the quality, the convenience of it, all of those things go up to making this little equation in our head of, am I getting a bargain for this dollar or this $20? The reality is it's a pretty selfish act most of the time. You know, it's something that we're doing and thinking about the bargain for ourselves, but quite often we're actually not thinking about all of those other unintended consequences from the use of that money. So we're not thinking about, are we shafting a whole bunch of other people because we're using this money a certain way? Because there's so many things that obviously we're all buying every day, you start to think collectively about how much money we're spending as a group. I just wanted to take a little wander through one purchase that most of us are probably going to be making every day. That's the simple act of buying a cuppa. Come and have a cup of tea with me, first of all. Tea's the most drunk beverage around the world after water. There's billions and billions of money in tea. The big companies each have brands worth billions of dollars. But if you're one of the two countries that make the most tea around the world, China or India, you probably haven't got a very nice taste in your mouth from the way that the tea production works. The reality is that an Indian, for example, that picks tea is getting about 57 cents a day equivalent for the cup of tea that you're drinking. And that person, because they're getting such a small amount of money in that supply chain, is really struggling to feed not only themselves, but also their children. What about coffee? Is coffee any different? There's a lot of money also in coffee, billions and billions of dollars in, in coffee. And the reality is that the world's biggest brands each have individual brands worth a billion dollars. So there's a huge amount of profit that's happening from this simple cuppa. But Oxfam talks about the people who are in coffee production being mugged. And I think it's the reality. A farmer might be getting 14 cents a kilo for the green beans that they're making for a product that's retailed at $26 or more in the supermarket for that same kilo. And you think about the difference in that. You know, you think about the fact that coffee around the planet, sales are absolutely booming and there's just so much money to be made. But Oxfam says the reality is the real prices equivalent means that the farmers are getting less than they did 100 years ago. So there's money to be made there, but it's not being distributed equally amongst all the people in that supply chain. Hot chocolate. So if you're like me, you're kind of over tea and coffee now, you want to have a hot chocolate. Is that any different? The reality is that 80% of the world's uh, cocoa comes from West Africa, 50% of it particularly from the Ivory Coast. And the Ivory Coast is a pretty dismal place to live if you're a young person. 200,000 young children are working, making cocoa for our hot chocolates and our, and our chocolate bars. 12,000 of them are living in slavery. So they've been trafficked into the cocoa plantations to make us our chocolate. It sounds, I know it sounds really extreme, and you might think, well, you've just taken these really extreme examples to give to us today, and you're trying to make us feel really bad about these things, but it's not just the stuff that we're drinking in reality. There's 250 million young people between the age of 5 and 14 on the planet who are in labouring around the planet 70% of them are working in food production. So it's not just our cuppers, but it's the stuff that we put on our plate so often is laced with child labour. That sounds really grim. So how do you know 
what to buy and what not to buy. I mean, you start to think, am I, am I part of that? Am I actually drinking someone else's poverty when I'm drinking something or eating something? So what I did is I took a trip to my local supermarket. Now, I live in Flemington in Melbourne, and I decided, well, let's get to the bottom of what some of the big brands are doing. So I went to my local supermarket and looked on the shelves. There's 161 choices of coffee on the shelves on my supermarket. And whilst it looks like I've got this gigantic amount of choice, it turned out that there were only three companies who owned a third of all of those different brands. They were Nestle, Sara Lee and Kraft. They each have brands worth over a billion dollars. I started to dig down into seeing how are those individual brands, the ones that most of us have in our cupboards, how are they actually doing? I used an organisation called Ethiscore. Many of you might have seen Ethiscore, ethiscore.org. And what they do is they take ratings of companies from around the world. They look at a bunch of things like how those companies treat the planet, treat their workers, treat animals, the supply chain of those different companies, are they responsible marketers? And what they do is they give them a, a score out of 20. Well, let's have a look at the big brands. Down here on the far left is Nestle. Nestle gets a 0.5 out of 20. Not so good, hey? But it's got Nescafe and Espresso and International Roast and a whole bunch of other brands there that are probably on our shelves. A little bit further to the right, you've got Unilever, also on a 0.5 out of 20 for its ethical practices. A company that owns a whole bunch of our tea brands like Lipton's and Bushels and Lan Chu. And you go a little bit further up and there's a whole bunch of other big brands. There's AB Foods who've got Twinings and Sara Lee who've got brands like Makona and Sensio and Harris. So it looks like we've got this phenomenal amount of choice, but we actually haven't got that much choice. And when you start to follow the money, the money just keeps on going back to those big players who we know if we start to look at the information don't actually think very much about the people in their supply chains. Sounds quite grim, but the reality is there are also a whole bunch of amazing companies. On the right there is Hampstead. If you come to Street, the organisation that I run, Street is going to serve you Hampstead tea. It's the equal top rating in Ethiscore for a tea, and it gets 17 out of 20. And even though I can't give you the fair trade organic coffee, the rating for that one that will serve you, what I did is took an average of all the fair trade organic coffees in Ethiscore, and the average was at least 15 out of 20. So there are a bunch of companies doing extraordinary things out there who are paying fairly, who aren't raping and pillaging the planet. And you start to see there's a really big difference between 0.5 and 17 for your cup of tea, isn't there? So please jump on and have a look at Ethiscore. But can you do more with this simple cuppa? The answer is absolutely. I would say that because I'm a social entrepreneur and I work in hospitality. And what I'm passionate about is essentially trying to solve really big, complex problems that have been hard to solve in the past. And in the case of myself, I'm really interested in solving youth homelessness. There are millions and millions of young people around the planet on the streets, and that's just not OK. So a social enterprise is essentially this kind of hybrid organisation that's half a for-profit and half a non-profit, and you put it together. And what you're doing is you're trying to solve a social issue by using the marketplace. So in our, place, in our case at Street, we're trying to solve homelessness by running cafes. We moved, my partner and I, uh, Kate, who's here today also, we moved from Canberra a couple of years ago to Start Street. We started really humbly. We've only got two little cafes in Melbourne CBD, and we've had 40 young people start to come through the program so far. But so far, we've managed to sell nearly 100,000 cuppers, and 100,000 cuppers can give 10,000 hours of employment for homeless young people. And it can give a lot of hope to a whole bunch of young people, but you start to think, that's just because people like you drank coffee and tea. I mean, a cup like this can start to change you guys into superheroes. So you get the product that you wanted, but we can start to use the marketplace to bring about a whole bunch of other change that we wouldn't normally bring about. I'm kind of a bit sick of the way welfare works, that it doesn't necessarily get people who most need long-term sustainable futures 
out of the welfare system. So, so I'm a big believer that kind of training and employment are absolutely critical to that. But what if I actually put solving homelessness out to you guys as well and you become part of that solution? So this is where I start to invite you on our mission. Our mission is making the perfect cuppa. Over the last two years, we've started to play with what we think makes a perfect cuppa. But I'm sure you're going to have a whole bunch of other things that you can contribute, so please, please talk to me afterwards or start, start talking with us over email because there's a bunch of things we're doing and I'd like to, to kind of share those with you. Well, first and foremost, you'll see me holding my cup out there smiling. And I'm smiling because I've paid my $3 and I've got the thing that I wanted. I wanted a really good tasting caffeine hit. So as the person who's bought this, I'm happy. My, my happy smiling face is one of the stories now in that cup of tea or in that cup of coffee. And off to the left, you'll see a farmer who's looking pretty happy as well because that farmer is working on an organic plantation, so hasn't been exposed to pesticides. So he and his family are pretty happy. And on the right, you'll see a coffee picker and she's pretty happy as well because she's getting fairly paid for the wage, in wages for the labour that she's doing because it's a fair trade coffee. And down the bottom, you'll see a bunch of smiling faces. There's Imogen and Andrew and Rain and Damien and Jamie, five of the first young people who came through our cl first class at Street. And because you bought this cuppa and not that cuppa, you've given these guys a job. And we can give hundreds of young people like this a job just by the simple choices that we're making. But it doesn't have to stop there. You'll see on the outside of the cup, up here, there's some artwork. We found out in the last year that a whole bunch of our young people are pretty talented in telling their stories. So by the end of this month, we're going to have a bunch of stories that we start to share with you, the creative expression of our young people on the outside of that cup, because we figure that's a pretty nice little canvas to start to share those stories. So that's an artwork done by one of our trainees, Serenity, who's done a bunch of artwork actually using our coffee as watercolour, and they'll be featured on there. The coffee grounds that were in there, the coffee grounds don't have to get chucked out. At Christmas time, what we did is we put them back into the soil, we made a great soil mix, and when you came and had a cuppa with you, we put it back in there and put a seed in there so you've got the beginnings of a herb pot to go home and start to make yourself a meal. And the good news is that the coffee cup, the, the coffee cup itself is completely compostable. Even the plastic lid is compostable. So when you get home, you don't need to chuck that in the bin or put it in landfill. You can put that in your garden or your compost bin to go back into the earth. And I'm hoping now you're thinking, this is a bloody good value cuppa. <laughs> so you're not just having one with us, you're having heaps with us. What you're doing now is you're coming back, and when you come back nine times, we'll make sure the tenth one, the tenth coffee or the tenth meal you have with us is given to a homeless person that we couldn't help through our program. So there's a person up here that's benefiting from your loyalty. Can we do more? Absolutely. Well, what about all the back-end systems, the administration of an organisation? Surely that's got to be full of inefficiencies and a whole bunch of things. You know, can you start to look at the supply chain of a back office? Absolutely. Our cleaning contract is done by another social enterprise that works with young people with intellectual disabilities. We don't have a company car. We've got a lot of us riding around on bikes. Our coffee is often distributed around our cafes on the public transport grid in Melbourne. Our, our um, cafes, if you come to them, you'll see lots and lots of red milk crates. That's because we've built our cafe walls out of recycled materials. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, I think. How much good can we actually do with just one simple little purchase? I think we could do this extraordinary amount. And I think about myself, you know, the, the repeated little things I'm going to do across my, life, you know, my lifetime. For all of you ladies here in the audience, you're going to have 85,000 meals in your lifetime. Guys, I'm sorry you only get 80,000 because you don't live as long. <laughs> it's the truth. Sorry, fellas. But you start to think then, just my life, making little conscious decisions about how I spend my money, just if it was only on food, the difference that I can start to make across the planet. But think of the millions of meals we're going to have collectively, the extraordinary social change that we can start to make as a bunch of people who say, it's not okay 
The way capitalism is figured right now doesn't have to be like this. There's a whole bunch of people getting rich at the top. There's billions of billions of dollars being made by those big companies who aren't thinking very much about how they're treating the rest of the planet. But it's really easy for us to think, geez, bugger, you know, those guys are the naughty guys, just, you know, we've got to be down on them. But the reality is, we're the ones who buy their products. They don't exist, they don't make the billions of profit if we're not giving them that money. So what I want you to do is reach into your wallets. Actually reach into your wallets. <laughs> Bend down, don't worry, I'm not going to take your money. <laughs> it's not a busking show. Reach down into your wallets. I want you to pull out a note. Look at it. Look at the note. Pull out a coin if you don't have any notes, sorry. <laughs> pull out a coin. Look at it. Look at either side. Look at, look at the faces on either side of that note and start to think, this is actually my vote. I don't, I don't ha no one's forcing me to give this away. I'm the one who gets to decide how this is used, and in actual fact, I'm the one who gets to decide all the other stories that get put on this note. All of the invisible faces, and I'm the one who gets to decide whether or not they're happy faces or they're sad faces. And the reality is there's so much information out there now to make good decisions as a consumer. But every time you go to the supermarket, that's your vote. And the checkout is your ballot box. You don't have to wait for three years to vote in who you want to see as leader of this country. You get to say every single day, this is what I'm voting on. This is the stuff that's important to me. And in fact, we get to change the system. Capitalism as it stands right now stinks. And I think the GFC is this extraordinary opportunity that we've got to say, we get to change what it looks like. In fact, the whole system works by these. And these are the things in my wallet and my pocket, and I don't get to part with this unless I say that it's worthwhile parting with it. So what I'd love to urge you to do is start thinking about it. Get armed with information. It's the way to make those really good decisions about what you should be spending and what you shouldn't be spending on. Think about not just reducing the negatives of the thing the stories that are on here. But think about how many actual amazing stories can I start to embed on this note. You have to buy the Ethical Shopping Guide. Many of you probably already have it, but it also has a phone app. On your smartphone, it means every kind of product in your supermarket shelves is in here. You can start to find out, what do I want to support? The guys that aren't doing so well, boycott them. You don't have to buy anything from them. Use up the stuff that's in your cupboard, so don't waste it, but use it up and change the brands that you're starting to support. And most of all, I want you to think that when I open my, next, my wallet the next time, I'm the one who gets to work out how many faces are happy on this. But I'm, when I open my wallet, I'm going to listen really carefully because my money's talking and I'm going to listen. Thank you. <laughs>